All right, kick it off. Kick us off, Nick. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, just some logistics. If you can't unmute yourself or turn on your video yet, it's because you haven't yet been upgraded to a panelist. But if you have been upgraded to a panelist, you're more than welcome to start your video or your audio. Uh, we're just trying to make sure that everybody who can participate um, is someone who should be participating just as an extra measure of security in our age of, um, of Zoom video conferences. So thanks for everybody. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. This is the first um, virtual light seminar that we've had, the first um, virtual light together we remember event we've had. The last time we got together to run professional development um, was in late January in person, and it was a huge success. So we wanted to replicate that during this um, Genocide Awareness Month campaign. I am going to share my screen right now. And can everybody see that? I assume you can. Um, we're going to go back and forth between screen sharing and between that grid Brady Bunch view that you just saw there. Uh, today, the subject of today is bridging the gap between education and action in the age of COVID-19. This is a really strange time that we're in. Okay, I'm on a... We're trying to, um, we're trying to offer professional development as best we can in this environment. And we also would like to make it as interactive and engaging as possible. Now, what we're going to do today, you can see our goals, approach, and agenda. We're going to get you inspired, get you informed, and get you involved. To get you inspired, we'll share the stories that bring us together today. I'll share my story, David will share his story, Lauren will share her story, and then we'll have you briefly share your story. The second part of our professional development is getting informed. I'm going to explain the light framework and the tools that educators can use to virtually collaborate with their students to counter hate in this age of virtual school. And you're going to learn how to participate in Together We Remember's Genocide Awareness Month online campaign. Third, you can get involved. I'll show you how to begin designing your light center, activate your center by organizing a Together We Remember vigil program, and you can leave here with a clear action plan. This, uh, at the beginning of this, what we'd love for everybody to do, or at least um, everyone from each region is to share what brings you here today, your name and your city or state, because originally this was planned for Pittsburgh, but now we have people from all over the place. If you could share your school and or your district or your role, because it's not all teachers here. And then what inspired you to attend this workshop? And we'd really love for this to take like 20 to 30 seconds to make sure that um, we can get moving into the program. And again, if there are you know, five people here from South Carolina, maybe one person can represent all of those people. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now. We'll go back to the Brady Bunch. So who, who wants to begin? Lauren, would you begin, please? <laughs> sure, hi everyone, I'm Lauren Barron's father. Am I muted? Oh my goodness, you have no idea how many times I've been muted when I start talking on these things. <laughs> So I see so many familiar faces from across the state of Pennsylvania and beyond, and it's just thrilling. Um, I'm director of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, and we're thrilled that we've been able to pivot quickly and offer this to you as an online training. Leave it there. Nick, you're on mute, buddy. You're making the mute mistake yourself this time. Sorry about that. Sorry. I'm making it cool. <laughs> um, Jeff, can you go next? Hi, I'm Jeff Ergel. I'm a, a faculty member at the University of South Carolina, and uh, I saw this through social media, and uh, it, it's becoming apparent that we're, we're going to have to begin to think about uh, how to prepare pre-service teachers who I work with uh, to not only receive professional development online, but also deliver instruction online to students. So I thought this would be a good bit of professional development for me. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and everybody else, if you could just kind of jump in um, instead of me calling on every single person here. Really good teacher facilitation, Nick. 
I'm Emily Bernstein. I'm the Education Outreach Associate at the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. Um, so if you're interested in any of our programs and teacher trainings in the future, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm Michelle Russo. I'm a teacher at Seneca Valley School District, which is up in Harmony, PA. Um, I live in Zilli, but I'm a teacher, have taught Holocaust study for quite a while. I am on track to go to Poland this summer with Classrooms Without Borders and have really used um, the resource and stuff now available to me to really dive into this even more to you know, improve my teaching. I'm uh, Francesca Cordes from Washington, PA, uh, Trinity Middle School. I teach eighth grade and we're getting ready to start our Anne Frank and Holocaust unit. So I'm just looking for some tools, techniques, because this is uncharted territory for us. I'm John Frasca. Um, I teach at Carson Middle School in North Allegheny. I teach eighth grade English. Um, like what was just mentioned, I'm in remote learning as we speak, so I'm getting ready to potentially teach the Holocaust online, and that was my motivation for joining this, to ensure that I could deliver it in a way that's effective for kids. I'm Jonathan Kajeski. I'm an adjunct professor that teaches uh, the Holocaust in college composition courses out in Northeast PA. I just drove out to Pittsburgh right before the state shut down. So it's nice to, for another one of these trainings, um, so it's nice to see some of you again without having to drive five to six hours, although it probably would have been quicker now. I'm Suzanne DiPietro Antonio from Central Valley High School, which isn't far from Pittsburgh. And I've been involved with the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh for a couple of years now. And I just wanted to hear more about what Nick has to tell us. And I'm Mary Shuttlesworth. I'm at La Roche University. I've been working with Emily um, through the Holocaust Center for a couple of years now um, and had planned to take some students to Germany and Poland next month, but that's not happening anymore. Rescheduled for next year, though. I am Carrie Zillian, and I teach with Suzanne at Central Valley High School. I'm also involved at the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, and Nick's been talking to us so much about his initiative. I just wanted to know more. Oh, and I'll share that um, Tiffany O'Shea is on this call. She's also involved with our Education Outreach Committee at the Holocaust Center. She teaches English at Montour, and she has dueling Zoom sessions right now, so she's chat only. Impressive. <laughs> no doubt. And then it looks like um, Mike, sorry, I'm not seeing the end of his last name. Oh, Mike Sherry doesn't have a mic. Um, Mike doesn't have a mic, but he teaches with Miss Cortese. Anybody else from any other organizations or schools or regions of the United States? Hi, I'm Cindy Goodman Lieb, and I'm in Pittsburgh, um, and I'm a community member involved with community relations and also an educator with the ADL. And I'm Lori Sisson. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and I run the Film Pittsburgh Teen Screen Program. So I know a lot of you already and um, wish we could be together this year. <laughs> Had a lot of cancellations for April and May. So I just, I just thought I would hang around and see what Nick was doing. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Anybody else? Last call. Hi. Uh, sorry, a little fussy baby here. Uh, I'm Rachel Worrell. I'm from uh, Egg Harbor Township High School in EHT, New Jersey. We're by Atlantic City. Um, I work with Stockton University. Um, and uh, we've actually done a few events with uh, some of you guys. So I thought I would get on. It was sort of pushed to us. And since I teach a Holocaust class and we're all in virtual learning right now, 
um, looking for new things that I can do. So thought I would join. Deborah, um, I saw you raised your hand and I just unmuted you. Can you tell us where you're from? Deborah Ween. Hmm. Maybe not. Deborah, you're welcome to send me a message in the chat and let me know, and then I can promote you up to a panelist so you don't have to raise your hand. All right. Well, for the sake of time, I'll get moving forward here. It is really cool if you look around the group here. There's a lot of people that wouldn't normally have been together had it not been for this strange situation that we're in. So um, I guess we'll have to look for the positives in it. And this is one of those positives. Uh, I've also invited a couple people here to speak about everything that I'm going to be speaking about. And they can, they can uh, do a much better job than I can because they lived it. So I have two students, one former student on the call and one current student on the call. The former student is Jimmy Byrne. And uh, he was one of my key go-to light people last year. And he had this idea. Um, and uh, I'll let him talk a little bit more about it. But it was all based around Indigenous Peoples Day and Columbus Day. Jimmy, can you kind of share the story of how light allowed you to get a little bit more involved in your community and become a community activist? Yeah, so um, we started last year in our multicultural studies class. And I remember we read that book. And um, my first thought after we read it was like, well, why didn't, you know, I learn about this sooner, I'm about to graduate. So I approached you. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm junior councilman for a small town, you know, I want to not only bring this to my community, but how like can I educate people on this? So we put our group together and we sat down and figured out, okay, how are we gonna present this to not only our school district, but all of our communities. And um, we figured out, like we eventually like got it accomplished, but it did take some time and it did take work. And then um, um, <laughs> Well, Jim, Jimmy, let me chime in here. The book that we're talking about is um, a multicultural picture book called Encounter. And it's really um, primarily a children's book. But we read it, and in the book they mentioned um, Columbus Day and the history of Columbus. And the students, students like Jimmy and some of his friends, decided, hey, you know what, let's get this recognized in our community. And that's what we're talking about today is how to get students um, – applying their skills to real world problems. So the problem that Jimmy identified is that his community, um, the mascot of his community was formerly the Indians and his community celebrated Columbus Day. And he wondered if we have a strong history of indigenous people in our community, why don't we celebrate indigenous people's day? Um, so Jimmy, successful or no? What's the end of the story? Uh, we were successful. Um, we got uh, the proclamation done in May of 2019, so right before graduation. And then we also brought it to our school district and had them put it on the calendar as well. And then from what then your students this year continue working on stuff with that. So yeah. it did make an impact within our area. Um, and then also from a lot of feedback that I got from it was that a lot of people didn't really know the history of Christopher Columbus or that sort of thing because they didn't, they never learned about it prior to us teaching them as well. And what, thank you, Jimmy, for sharing that. What Jimmy um, left at my school was a legacy of, uh, he started to kind of push the ball forward a little bit. And the next generation of students, the next class of students stepped up. And what they did is they, um, they were able to do Indigenous Peoples Day programming now that we commemorate and celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. Destiny, you are a current student. <laughs> Can you please share um, how you were able to carry the torch and plan Indigenous Peoples Day programming this year? Yeah, no problem. So um, in November, we held an Indigenous Nation celebration at our local library. Um, <laughs> and um, we had some Indigenous community members that had really had the opportunity to showcase their culture in Shaler before. Um, so since Shaler is a predominantly like white community, 
uh, we gave them the opportunity to kind of like showcase their culture through dances, um, bringing in like homemade, uh, I don't want to say crafts, but like items that they were selling, which were really cool. Um, I think we got a painting to put in the classroom, which was really cool. Um, and we got to ask them like personal questions and um, work with the kids that they brought and to, like take pictures. And it was just a really like eye-opening experience because like I said, they hadn't really been able to showcase their culture in our community before. So it was just really nice to be able to open the doors up for them and let them come in. Thank you, Destiny. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I am going to go back to screen sharing here. And take you into the story of how it is that I came about this idea um, and put it into practice of getting students into leadership roles in Holocaust, genocide, and human rights, education, remembrance, and advocacy. And it all starts with this guy. His name's Jack Sitzamer. And Jack is the first Holocaust survivor that I met. I was probably 22 years old, 23 years old, and I was tasked with teaching the Holocaust. And I really looked at myself in the mirror and wondered, how am I qualified to teach the Holocaust? I'm not Jewish. I don't have any survivors in my family. This doesn't seem like something I should just be teaching with a textbook and review questions at the end of the textbook. It seems like something that I, I need to do justice, but I don't know how. Thankfully, I had the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, and uh, they said, call up Jack, bring him to your school. He'll, he'll speak to as many students as you want. And after that, then you can follow up with you know, questions and answers and all that stuff. So I went to Jack's house, picked him up, brought him to Shaler. He spoke in the auditorium. And at the end of his presentation, there was the impossible. There were, what, probably 350 ninth graders that were just silent. You could hear a pin drop. And then they came up and lined up to be able to shake his hand and to hug him and get their picture with him. And it changed their lives. Whenever I was driving Jack back to his house that day, he took me to the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh for the first time. He gave me the book that is pictured there on the right-hand side. And he signed it. And he said, someday I'm going to be gone. And you're going to have to show this book to students to prove that I was alive. And you are going to have to be the one to share my story. And his exact words were, I'm going to die soon. And when I do, it's up to you to tell my story. And I wondered, how in the world am I ever going to tell a Holocaust survivor's story? I knew I needed to. I knew I had an obligation to. But I had no idea how I was going to recreate that moment. And then I started to think about all of the, um, what I started to think about is I started to think about all of those moments in education where my students were putting time and effort into all of their projects and I was just throwing them away. And I thought of this as disposable education. I was teaching students how to write and then I was throwing away the things they turned in. I was teaching them how to give presentations. They would give the presentations to their classmates and then it would be over with. And I thought, I need to create something where the students are the leaders in their community. And I came up with this idea of light, leadership through innovation in genocide and human rights teaching, the Light Education Initiative. And the goal through this was to inspire, prepare, and empower students for leadership roles in Holocaust, genocide, and human rights, education, remembrance, and advocacy. There are three tiers of light. The first is I thought there needs to be a space within schools that is a humanities maker space. I see light as really the yin to the yang of STEM or STEAM. We teach students how to be incredibly innovative through STEM and STEAM, but I, I feel like light gives them real world problems to solve, specifically centered on Holocaust, genocide, and human rights education. So in my school now, there is a space that acts as the hub of all of this. Second, light programming, which bridges the gap between education and action and creates these culminating experiences that tie to curriculum. Third is a light coordinator, somebody who facilitates this programming within a school and runs the light center. And I also knew that this had to be incentive based. It had to be something that teachers wanted to do not something that teachers had to do. 
and it had to be something that they would be rewarded for doing. And that's what this whole system is built around. Now, if I were to really go through all the tiers of light, I wanted just to show you that there will be future professional development down the road on this. I would walk you through all of these different points of light centers, light programming, and light coordinators. But we just don't have the time for all of that today. Light changed in the beginning of this school year because I met David and um, Lauren and David and I started working together on the Together We Remember um, campaign, on the Together We Remember program that we would be having in, uh, in April. So my first question before I pass it over to David that I asked myself was how can my students be put into leadership roles in the Together We Remember campaign? And I think the first, the first question I had to address was, did our state even have Genocide Awareness Month as, as, a, recognized, um, as a recognized holiday, as not a holiday, but as a recognized month of um, commemoration and remembrance? And Pennsylvania did not. So my students then co-wrote, co-authored a Genocide Awareness Month proclamation, reached out to their state representatives. And in Shaler, we have a Democratic representative and a Republican representative in the state house. And they were able to get the Genocide Awareness Month proclamation co-sponsored. And the students were invited to Harrisburg to read it on the house floor to have Genocide Awareness Month. Um, become a permanent fixture in Pennsylvania. The students were supposed to go in mid-April. Obviously, that got canceled, but it's still scheduled to be read on the House floor in mid-April by those representatives. So, David, I'm going to turn it over to you. If you could talk a little bit about your story and about Together We Remember. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, and I would not be here if it weren't for the efforts of Nick and the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh and connecting the dots. And I truly think that the work that Together Remember is doing um, is so enabled by the light organization and the project that you've built, Nick. So thank you so much for what you're doing. And I was always saying I needed an educator, like a real educator. I found myself doing a lot of uh, informal education work. Um, and now that we're able to team up with folks who have this rigorous skill set um, and experience in the classroom, it's made my work that much um, better. So uh, hello, everyone. It's really nice to, to meet you. My name is David Estrin. I'm the founder and CEO of Together We Remember. We're a nonprofit organization and an emerging movement now all over the country and the world dedicated to empowering the next generation of leaders to make never again a reality by transforming remembrance into action. And that's really the most important part. And I found my way into this work and this movement because of my family story. Something you'll learn very quickly about me, often uh, folks say, well, what do you do? What are you passionate about? And then very quickly, I end up talking about genocide because uh, all four of my grandparents were Holocaust survivors in really different ways. And their experiences and how they shared their stories with me completely opened my eyes to the power of collective memory to wake up young people to be social justice advocates. And so many of Nick's students are like that. And it's not that I even had the personal connection. It's just exposure to survivors in this history, particularly, um, gets young people to, to want to engage and make the world a better place. I am patient zero for my own experience. Um, and when I was a junior at Duke University, my grandpa, uh, who had survived the Mauthausen and Auschwitz concentration camps, he passed away. And for me, that was my generational moment, my in Judaism and Hebrew, it's the Lador Vador moment, the ge generation to generation moment where um, I had to step up and carry on his legacy. And I went back to school and I asked myself, how could I honor my grandpa's memory in a way that would be relevant, meaningful, but most importantly, actionable to my school community and to future generations. Um, at the time, Israel and Gaza were at war. Uh, Jewish and Muslim relations were really tense, but uh, there was no Holocaust Remembrance Day program. And one of my close friends who was the Muslim chaplain of the university said, David, do you have an idea for a program that you could organize? Um, and I ended up choosing to uh, organize a remembrance vigil uh, for the entire school community with my colleagues from different uh, walks of life on campus, different religions and faiths. And so what that turned into was 10 hours in the most high profile, high traffic part of the campus. 
um, students from all backgrounds, community members, survivors of not just the Holocaust but different genocides, reading the names of victims of not just the Holocaust but different genocides for 10 hours and then 24 hours in the second year. And what was amazing about that is it created space for all these other types of programs, storytelling, lectures, dialogues, pledges, exhibitions, art projects, you name it, we were doing it on the same day and in conjunction with um, the name reading vigil. And so we said, well, what if we do these kinds of programs all over the world and at the same time? And what if we can share this story on social media and really take back the power when it comes to shaping the narrative and believing in a world in which never again can actually be a reality? And so that's what we did. Uh, and I'm really proud to share that uh, a couple years later, that was 2012, here we are now, eight years later, we've organized over 100 remembrance programs in nine different countries around the world, uh, mostly in high schools and college campuses across the United States. And I had the privilege last year in January to speak at the United Nations and share a bit of my story. Um, with with folks and it was incredible sitting across from me was the ambassador from Austria and Mauthausen the camp my grandpa survived was in Austria and he, he apologized on behalf of all of his people that hopefully if any God forbid if anything like the Holocaust were to uh, emerge again that his folks would be on the right side of history and that was one of those surreal moments where I was just like wow um, so anyways we've come a long way and I'm so excited to share this movement and this opportunity to collaborate with you and your students um, and one more thing I should share is we had a couple dozen events that were lined up all across the country, um, but we, instead of canceling them, we decided to go virtual. And so we've got a bunch of things going on that we're about to tell you about. And so now we're going to shift to the second part of our program, um, shifting from getting inspired to getting informed. And we want to share a bit more about the approach. We want to take you under the hood of both light and together we remember, so you understand the framework and the methodology. And it's important for your students to also have an understanding of these methodologies, especially if they're going to be bridge building experts themselves. Um, and then we also want to share a bunch of the events and the resources that are available to get rocking and rolling pretty soon. So uh, it just so happened that when I had some educators who knew what they were doing look at what our work was, they were like, you know what, David, you're actually combining experiential learning, project-based learning, and service learning. I was like, what are those things? And, I was, and then they told me, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. Um, and, and the reason why we were able to connect those dots was because um, we were – working with students in a way in which they were getting hands-on experience, figuring out how to make change happen in their community, and figuring out what works and what doesn't firsthand, right? So in that, in that way, it was experiential. Um, we also believed through our work that students shouldn't be just looked at as knowledge consumers, but also knowledge creators with historical literacy. So I keep getting submissions to our database of victims of different genocides from students that are creating the content that we are working with, which is incredible. Um, and that's part of the project-based component of it. Uh, and then sec third, um, we also believe that students can not just learn from history, but they can make history themselves and benefit their communities. And that's the component of it that's related to service learning. And in that process, young people, as well as our educators that we work with, become stewards of the past and change makers for the future. Um, and it's been really exciting to see this play out time and again and in so many different ways. And Nick's story with his students is a prime example of that. But it's one of many and we want to unleash dozens of more at the same time and now virtually. Another thing that's really important to share is the methodology that underpins um, really any remembrance and bridge building event or program that we organize and encourage you to bring into your virtual classroom and into your virtual communities. Um, and those are the following. Number one, when you look around our event space, you'll see folks who perhaps never came together before. It's an unprecedented, unlikely group of allies across lines of difference usually. These are the folks that need to do the work. Second, and often this is the hardest part, right? How do you get these folks to show up when there is often a legacy of mistrust? It takes a lot of work to make that happen. Second, opening hearts and minds with arts and stories. We all are carrying trauma and our communities have collective traumas. So to be open-minded to what is possible in terms of creating change and peace in our communities and around the world, the arts and storytelling often goes a very long ways. To prepare us for number three, which is facilitating learning about atrocities past, as well as present and taking and relying on the experts that are already in your community. So for example, if you're in Pittsburgh, um, there are a ton of folks at the universities who you can rely on, bring into your classroom. There are survivors from the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh that you could work with um, to enable young people to get exposed to certain histories. 
I, as someone who grew up in Boca Raton, Florida, predominantly Jewish community, uh, with tons of resources, and, and I had a number of privileges, it was only really until college that I learned about genocides beyond the Holocaust. And that was something that I was quite frustrated by. Um, and so we want to expose young people to different histories. And fourth, this is the most important step, fostering trust and belonging through solidarity activities. So we've gone through getting all the folks who need to show up to show up. They're open-minded and open-hearted. They have more information. They're becoming expert in the subject matter. But we still have to build those bridges and create a new identity so that it's not the typical, you know, whether it's a political party or race, religion, politics, whatever it may be, but similar to like a school identity or it's kind of, kind of like when you go on trips and you come back and you're like, I was there in that experience before. And it's something that brings people together. We do that through name reading vigils, through dialogue activities and a variety of other things that we'll tell you about in a little bit. And then once you have that trust, you really can then move on to five and six, which I have in gray because you really want to get there. Um, you have to earn your way there by getting through step four, which is five, pra practicing taking action. Uh, and then six, sharing the story. Because if you take action and you make a difference in your community like Nick's students with Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, you want to tell that story because that's the sort of stuff that makes people believe change is possible and gives them new ideas for what, what is possible and, and to make that happen. Um, in a more sustainable way. Um, but you don't want to tell that story and you don't want to practice action until you have that trust and belonging with the group of folks that you're trying to work with. Um, a couple of organizing questions that I think are helpful to think about are um, where do you want to spark or spread the light flame or together member flame uh, within your community or across your communities. So think about it, do we do this just with our class? Do we do this with our whole school community? Or do we do it with our entire community and even communities connecting the dots? That's why I like that graphic on the right where you can imagine this web coming together and here here we are on this call right now with a bunch of different schools. On Monday we had a call with student leaders across the country and we had um, at least five cities and perhaps a dozen schools represented and we could do something together which was really exciting to think about and imagine. But if you're someone who's like look I have so much on my plate and I just have I need one period something quick that I can do we certainly have opportunities where you can uh, plug in some lesson plans and programs which Nick's, Nick will talk about in a little bit. So now I want to transition to some of the events that we have coming up. We took a bunch of those events that were in person and previously canceled and we moved them online with our coalition of various Holocaust, genocide, and human rights museums and other organizations all across the country. And even some folks around the world are starting to reach out and say, hey, I got, I got some folks in South Africa that say, can we participate? Um, which is so exciting and so interesting. So um, what I'm going to do is highlight a couple of these events for you that would be especially um, student friendly. I didn't want to actually exit out of that presentation yet. Hold on one moment. Click the wrong button. Here we go. Um, three events to put on your radar. This Sunday, uh, the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh is hosting our virtual summit, uh, What Does Never Again Mean to You? It's going to be an incredible panel with some of the country's leading experts on countering identity-based violence, as well as those who've lived the American dream from uh, escaping um, uh, genocide and violence in Kurdistan uh, to arriving in the United States and, and then reforming white supremacist Nazis. That's one of our speakers, of Dr. Haval Kelly. We've got Susan Bro, the mother of Heather Heyer from Charlottesville. And Heather was uh, uh, killed in Charlottesville, unfortunately, um, by a white supremacist. But Susan is a powerhouse of an activist and a storyteller. Uh, and we also have some other in incredible speakers who, um, who will be joining us. And then we also have a, a virtual lecture that I will be leading on April 8th uh, on Wednesday, which we call Wisdom Wednesday. Um, and it's going to be about the history of the atrocity prevention movement. So what I'll be doing in an interactive way uh, and discussion format is sharing the origin of the atrocity prevention movement and how we got to now and where we're at and, and how folks can get involved both through Together Remember but also more broadly. Um, and then third, we have an incredible virtual performance by one of my favorite musical groups um, called Fly By Light. These are student former student activists, they're artists, they're poets, and they created this incredible music video called Peace and Positivity. And they'll be joining us. They'll be doing some impromptu spoken word and rap. Um, so definitely something that your students, I think, would love, especially those that are artistically inclined and, and are aspiring artists. So those are a couple to call out for you. And now what I'm going to do is shift my screen share uh, to our website and give you a tour. Actually, hold on. I have one more thing to show you. Sorry, y'all. 
I'm going to give you an overview of the resources that we have. Um, so there are a bunch of resources that are available to you to get rocking and rolling with um, as of today. If you go to the Together Remember website, uh, the whole website is just basically a, a resource portal for you to uh, find what you need and um, bring it into your virtual classroom and work with your students. So we have a virtual playbook with uh, various uh, guidance and recommendations to create a virtual event and access to our tools and resources and materials that you see listed below. We have our virtual memorial, which uh, streams the names of victims of genocides and atrocities from our database 24-7, 365, and has testimony videos. We've got our virtual event calendar, which I previewed with you just before. Um, we have a name reading app, which we're going to use in a little bit together. So you could literally have a name reading right here, right now, using your phone. We have a pledge sheet, which is wonderful to showcase how, uh, who, what, why, and how you pledge to remember as an individual, and it's a great group project. Um, and then we also have a flexible lesson plan that Nick created, which is uh, really, really helpful uh, for, for folks who are looking for things that um, align with state standards, especially in Pennsylvania, but I'm sure they would work um, otherwise as well. So now I'm going to shift my screen share, if I can get the technology to work, to uh, the website itself and give you a bit of a tour. Um, can you see what I am sharing? Nick, can you confirm? Yep. Do you see the website? Yep. All right, now if only I can find it. There we go. I'm still getting used to jumping between all these different tabs. Um, all right, so let's first go to the virtual memorial. If it decides to load. I'll skip that one for now, maybe. Let's go to the virtual resource hub. There we go. That's actually Nick's classroom. That's the uh, the light center, which will be, which uh, which hopefully when we can get back into classrooms, we could talk about how to uh, how to convert your spaces into light centers. Um, and that was one of our professional development workshops in January. But here, what we've done is tried to save you a ton of time, and we collected various resources from different museums and human rights organizations across the country uh, to help you bridge the gap between education and action. So we have our virtual playbook, um, but also from different Holocaust museums. Um, um, as well as a resource, uh, more broad resources from organizations like Teaching Tolerance and Facing History. Um, and we're also going to be adding some resources about how to talk about COVID-19 with students if that's something that um, is common in your virtual uh, classroom. So we have that available to you. Um, and then now the more fun part is where to get involved. So we have all these different virtual events um, that are right here ready for you to learn more about and also register. Some of the ones I highlighted are, they're all here, um, especially, again, underlining the summit on Sunday and my uh, history of atrocity prevention uh, on uh, next Wednesday. But we've got virtual meditations, other performances, so much else coming, and also a bunch that's being added every single day. So definitely recommend bookmarking that page and checking in on it every every now and then to see what's, what's new. Um, that virtual playbook that I told you about, uh, it is also here, and it has guidance if you already have a virtual event and need uh, recommendations for how to organize your technology. And then the most important part, though, is more about the Together Remember framework, as well as links to our name reading sign-up template, the name reading app I told you about, our pledge sheet, and a whole folder of education resources, which is where you can find Nick's uh, flexible lesson plan. So I know we're going really, really fast today, but I wanted to. We want you to actually know where everything is, um, and then you can explore it further, and we can uh, connect uh, offline further about about that. Something else to Point, uh, point out is we have a youth action network that just launched because students wanted it to happen and we put students in leadership positions per Nick's uh, recommendations and within a couple of days we had 60 young people from all across the country on a call and so this is a great page to share with your students and say hey if this is of interest to you jump in and start collaborating with students all across uh, the country. I will be setting up a, a, a sign-in form that's more detailed, but for now, feel free to just send us an email at info at togetherweremember.org. Um, All right, so that is our virtual tour. I'm going to get us back into the presentation in just a moment. 
then we will shortly open it up for some activities. Oh, great. I have a video to show you. Um, so before we do a couple of these exercises, I'd love to share with you a story about Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland. Ivy Seamus is an incredible teacher who teaches the Holocaust year-round at, at MSD. And Ivy signed up to organize a Together Remember vigil in her school before the shooting happened. I'm from that part of uh, the country, so this especially hit me hard. Um, but we, of course, had to postpone. And Ivy has a wonderful relationship with the Pittsburgh community, Lauren especially, from the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. Um, and so it's really special that finally last year we were able to make that vigil happen with her students. And I brought a survivor of the Rwandan genocide to, uh, to, uh, to their school, and his school was massacred during the genocide. And so it was just really empowering and, and, um, and special to see the students and, and Emmanuel connect. So what I'd love to do if it works is actually show you a brief piece of the video of the pledges that students um, created using our pledge sheet. So I'm going to be, yes, jumping again to a different screen share. Um, and let's see if I can get this to work. Uh, Nick, will you give me a thumbs up if everything is showing up well once I start hitting play? Okay, because I can see your video. Can you remember Olivia Engel, who lost her life in the Sandy Hook shooting? Can we remember Martin Richard? He was one of the youngest victims of the Boston Bombing. Together we remember Rachel Scott, who was killed at Columbine High School. Mm. Together we remember Liam Paul Sosha, a Holocaust upset. Together we remember Eric Feist, a victim of the Marjorie Stone and Douglas shooting. Together we remember Trevor Martin, a victim of gun violence. Together we remember Cecil and David Rosenthal, brothers who were killed at the Tree of Life synagogue. Together we remember Anne Frank, a victim of the Holocaust who inspired millions with her words. Together we remember Joseph, two T survivors. 30 the Together we remember Joaquin Oliver killed at the Stoneman Douglas school shooting um, to keep the conversation of violence alive and to work to find peace. The rising of the sun and its going down, we remember them. At the blowing of the wind and the chill of the winter, we remember them. At the opening of the buds and the in, in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. At the business of the skies and in the warmth of the summer, we remember them. At the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember them. At the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember them. As long as we live, they live too, for they are now a part of us as we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have joy we crave to share, we remember them. When we have, de when we have decisions that are difficult to make, we remember them. When we have achievements that are based on theirs, we remember them. As long as... As long as I've lived, they will live too, for they are now a part of us and we remember them. Especially younger folks, when I'm sharing my story, it's not a crazy genocide that happened in a really cruel, crabby, crazy African people. It's a humanity crisis. If it can happen to Rwanda, it can happen to anywhere. Maybe not from Bhutan to Tutsi, but from other kind of difference. Right, and, and actually, when you leave this class, you see a poster on the wall over there. Ellie Wiesel said that when you listen to a witness, you become a witness. So Absolutely. we all just heard you, Absolutely. and now it's our responsibility to tell others about your story. So that was a video that was created by the students in the class, um, and it was incredible. We shared it on social media, and um, it was really successful and just it was one of the most powerful experiences that I've ever been through in my life um, in that classroom on that day um, and that has inspired us to continue using the TWR pledge sheet um, more than ever and we actually have groups of a group of students in Indiana that have asked people all across the country to submit um, their their pledge template just showing you what it looks like here and answering these questions and they're going to stitch together a video that by the end of April will be hopefully really powerful and commemorate victims of all different atrocities across um, across the country um, so so yeah um, Nick just I'm checking time and I, I can't see the chat because I'm sharing screen I just want to check in and see do we want to proceed with still doing the activity or just talk through it um, so that why don't, we why don't you just uh, talk through it briefly um, for the sake of time just I don't want to uh, hold anybody longer David and I will both be on the call longer but we want to make sure that we wrap up at 3 30 what we intended to share with you yeah great all right good so I'm glad I asked 
Um, so this is the name reading ceremony activity that you could do even virtually with your students. It was originally designed for like a community space, but what, what we've done with folks before is you go to that URL, bit.ly slash twenty twenty and you'll find the app and when you tap the screen a different name of a victim of a, of a genocide or an atrocity will appear where they perished and when or how old they were um, and you can invite folks to in a circle or at random um, take turns reading names of what appears on the screen for however long you want um, or you can organize a more formal name reading ceremony that takes place over multiple hours or an hour um, there's really no limits to how it can be done but it tends to be a really powerful experience and everyone connects to it in a in a different way and it's helpful to then um, you know ask folks what came up what do they think about as they were reading names and it's just it's always been a special experience every time I do it and for different reasons so we want to really share that with you um, that you know I often ask the question what's in a name and someone once told me you know all of humanity and it's just really um, it's really special to uh, to see that play out so recommend having a look at that resource and, and doing that activity um, as part of perhaps a class-based or community-based vigil even virtually and then the second thing is that pledge and dialogue activity um, where you can invite your students to fill this out, either, you know, print it out and create artwork with it, like the students at MSD, answering these questions, choosing a different genocide or an atrocity to research and find an upstander or a victim um, or survivor to, to profile. I think it's very important that students are in the driver's seat to choose what they want to remember and why and who. Um, and uh, we often will do this in sort of a ceremonial way. Uh, uh, if it's a, a more, um, if it's an activity for one day or one moment versus, you know, a sustained project over time, which is also an option um, and uh, inviting folks to share not just what they wrote, but what's the story behind why they wrote what they wrote. And that can be very, um, very powerful as well. Um, and there's a couple of guiding questions that are really at the core of what we do. And it is the following one. What is the meaning of never again in your community, in our community? Um, often. You know, for example, I'm here in Baltimore, and Baltimore is very much uh, the way it is with a number of challenges because of an unaddressed legacy of genocide, of slavery, of racial terror lynching, of Jim Crow, um, and now um, violence with police and uh, mass incarceration. So there are a lot of redlining. I mean, the list goes on. So never again has a really important contemporary meaning right in our backyards in many cities, in all cities, really, in the United States. And of course, the land that we are on you know, indigenous land, um, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot to be explored in our backyards. And second, how do we actually collaborate to make Never Again a reality, right? It's one thing to do a vigil in which we kind of say kumbaya and there's, you know, it, it does mean a lot, but at the same time, so what? Like, how do we translate and honor memory by taking action? Um, so that's the second question that we invite you to think about with your students as you uh, design your projects and programs. All right, the last part of the presentation before we open it up to, to uh, questions is uh, and dialogue is getting involved. And I want to turn it back to Nick. Um, and Nick, I'll just, since I'm ready, do you want me to give you back the presentation? Yes. Yeah, give me back the presentation, if you could, please, and thank you. Yeah. Okay, David, can you see yeah. that? Perfect. Um, so why together we remember and light fit so perfectly together is light is all about getting students opportunities to take their communities in their own hands to build community to make positive changes to just make it better than they found it and leave it better than they found it and together we remember's mission is transforming remembrance into action and what you heard at the beginning of this with my students fighting to get indigenous people's day recognized in their community it's it proves that all of this is really, um, it's kind of, I heard the description today, open sourced, meaning at one school, it may be women's rights. At another school, it may be indigenous people's day. At another school, it may be building a Holocaust memorial. It's just, it looks different depending on your community. You have to think about the needs of your community. And what I wanna do is I wanna pass something off to you that I've made for these this virtual moment we're in i'm going to share with you a link to this presentation so that you can follow all of these links and um on your own time because there's no there's no way for me to walk you through every bit of everything the point of professional development is for me to give you tools you can use and that you can share with people that are useful to you and that's what i'm going to do right now in the next couple minutes is show you some things that are useful to you that are turnkey that you can use tomorrow with your students and the first one 
is this lesson plan that I made that if you click on the link, it takes you to the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh's digital resources. And if you scroll down, you see it says resources for educators. And I made this Together We Remember Flexible Instruction Day lesson plan, and I included all the attachments. And it's really like copy paste. You're ready to roll. And students can, um, they can dive right into this, and you can dive right into this too. And as you can see, it puts students in a leadership role in, um, in Together We Remember. So what I have here is I have the overview, the assignment, the subjects and grades, the, um, the Bloom's taxonomy, uh, you know, students will be able to, and all the learning objectives, the procedure, everything is there for you. And then you can copy paste these student directions, which has students walk through um, a Together We Remember name reading vigil. So they're doing a basic introduction, they're learning a survivor story, and you can see they can watch a four-minute survivor story that's David's grandfather. They could watch a 74-minute survivor testimony from Jack Sitzamer. They could go on any of these um, resources like USC Shoah Foundation, USHMM, and they, it's really the sky's the limit. Or they could watch testimonies of Rwandan survivors or Cambodian survivors. Then they learn about genocide and mass atrocities. And one of the ways they can do this is by taking part in the Together We Remember campaign. So the students could chime in to this live lecture, take part in this moment um, at, at noon on April 8th, and you could treat this as a virtual field trip with your students, or you could treat it as a virtual assignment, or it could be virtual professional development. It's, it's really like sky's the limit. Then the students participate in a virtual vigil, either on their own, with their family, friends, or community, or they can participate this Sunday in the nationwide virtual vigil that is the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh and Together We Remembers program. Once they're done, they do one of these pledge sheets. Who will they remember? What will they remember? Why? And how will they remember? And then again, they're back in the driver's seat because step six is they're sharing what they've learned and they're practicing taking action, whether it's surrounding Genocide Awareness Month or something else. The um, online resources are attached for you to be able to easily upload this to Google Classroom or whatever it is you use. The standards are here. And then there's a student worksheet if you need something for the students to turn in. And it's really simple and it's really straightforward. And I think, very importantly, it's made by teachers for students. And uh, I used it in my class, and the students found it to be very easy. If I go back to the other opportunities, you can treat these Together We Remember virtual events as virtual field trips, virtual PD, and or virtual student projects for the entire month of April. All you have to do is click the link to the events, and the sky is the limit again or your students could become part of this youth coalition, this youth crew. There's a student ambassador named Charlotte Olson who's leading this. She's absolutely amazing. And my students have jumped into it and they're loving it. They're saying, I'm actually excited about school again. The second thing you can do to get students into leadership roles is connect them with their Holocaust centers or museums. Whether it's the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh or whether it's the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, you can take them on virtual field trips and for the first time, I think, ever, you can, for, for some of you, you're in the, this whole um, virtual environment where you can require them to do these things, and they actually will probably do it. Maybe it's because they have to. Maybe it's because they want to. Maybe they're bored sitting at home. But I think they're more likely to go on these virtual field trips with you now than they have ever been. And the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh has a new exhibition online that you can check out. The Early Warning Project through the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, if you look at that, it's, um, if you've never seen it before, what it does is it shows you the, um, the map of statistic, statistical risk of where it is likely that a mass atrocity or genocide will happen next. And I have a lesson plan for you that students can dive into where they, it's under light in action if you click on it, where they will... Um, be able to do a genocide awareness project. So again, if you click on these links, you'll see Light in Action, um, Genocide Awareness Project. Click here to download a PDF. Everything is free. Everything is there for you. 
Third, you can connect your students to local or national projects like the Butterfly Project, where they're actually making a Holocaust memorial in their community, in their school, or right now, even in their house to hang in their window. They could get involved in arts and writing competitions, um, once again, explained on the Light website, or civic engagement projects like getting Indigenous Peoples Day or Genocide Awareness Month recognized in your school community and on your school calendar. And lastly, they can and you can bring light to your school just by going on the Light website, clicking on Bring Light to My School, and you're prompted to fill out a very simple questionnaire and give some very basic information, and then I can get you connected to this network. Because as you're seeing, this really isn't um, this really isn't something that I can go over in uh, in a half an hour or an hour very easily, but you can start doing this tomorrow very easily. And lastly. Imagine if your school had grant funding to start to build a light center. We already have grant funding available to teachers to begin doing this work, and we're, we're already, through the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, distributing this grant funding. Just yesterday, I had another meeting to secure more grant funding for more schools to truly make this incentive-based, meaning to truly allow you um, to do projects that you're excited about, to have students be in the driver's seat utilizing their STEM skills and to be changing the dynamic of your school. With that said, David, have I missed anything um, super crucial? No, I don't think so. I just think uh, the only thing would be just to, you know, just turn remembrance into action, right? So this stuff's ready to go for you from on the website, on Nick's website, uh, for Light, um, and we're here to help. I mean, what else are we doing, right? Um, we are trying to uh, change the world virtually at a time that we have to come together urgently to make a difference. So um, we're here to help, and um, yeah, I'll probably stop talking to see if anyone has questions. Well, David, one last thing that I want to say is that in the chat right now is the link to all of these things that I just shared. So if, if you click on that link, it'll take you to a PDF that, um, as you can see on the last slide, is everything that we have talked about. And it allows, actually not the last slide, the uh, 26th slide. Those are all the hyperlinks to everything that was shared. Any questions from anybody at this point in time? It is 329. If you'd like to ask questions in the chat, um, feel free. If you'd like to ask questions aloud, feel free. If you'd like to leave the chat at 3.30, because that's really um, all we asked from you originally. It was 2.30 to 3.30. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for participating, and I hope to hear from you soon. We also welcome feedback. So if you, if you say, hey, I think this is pointless, this is terrible, you should <laughs> tell us right now. In the chat, though. <laughs> That's true, because we are recording and we're on Facebook Live right now. <laughs> Seeing lots of thank yous, which is great. Love hearing that. Very grateful for what, all the work that you're doing as well. All right, we have a question from Tiffany. Will there be another student-led meeting? My students were quiet during the last one, but that had so many, ide so many ideas and takeaways. The answer is yes. We're going to be stu doing weekly student-led uh, Zoom meetings, um, most likely on Sundays. Um, if you, uh, and the other thing I recommend is if your students are not yet on the Slack channel, to get on the Slack channel, I sent an email invite to every student that was in, uh, that registered for the call. Um, and Tiffany, if you give me the, all, everyone's email addresses, we can also, um, we can also get those invites out to everyone that you truly want to be into the, in that youth channel um, as well. And so the students are already talking and collaborating there right now. Jonathan says, this was great. So many resources for those that need standards alignment, other resources to convince their admins of the value of new and exciting teaching approaches. Nick, you can comment on that because you've definitely um, you know, helped move your community forward in that way. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, um, as teachers, I feel like all of us, when we retire someday, want to be able to say, you know what, I, I left my school better than I found it, and I gave my students opportunities that they owned. <clears throat> and I stumbled on that originally because what I, you know, what I used to do is I used to, I used to approach social studies as the old like sage on the stage, hit him with as much information as possible, and it was really difficult for me to back away and accept that 
honestly, you don't, it's, as we all know, you don't have to teach them everything, especially not with today's technology, but you do need to give them experiences trying things in a safe environment where they're allowed to fail. Meaning what we're doing through light is we're letting the students really like shoot for the moon and, and if they miss, it's okay. Like no, nobody gets hurt, but they can then use those experiences for the rest of their life saying, hey, I tried to get something changed at the state level. I tried to get something recognized um, on my school calendar. I stood in front of a school board. I stood in front of a council and it was hard and maybe I didn't succeed every time, but I learned those skills. And I think the last thing I'll say about that is what, what my students learn most about the Indigenous Peoples Day efforts is they said, I thought it was going to be easy. I never thought it would be this much work, but it was all worth it at the end of the day. Even though it took eight months to do something they thought would take eight minutes, it was all worth it at the end. Awesome. I saw a comment complimenting our slides and presentation. Uh, thank you, Nick, for pulling it together so well. And also thank you to, my, to the folks who were my bosses when I was a business strategy consultant, because that helps. It helps. I don't have any really real skills other than making PowerPoint slides. That's a link to the presentation. If you missed it, here it is again. And there's a lot of Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh links coming up. And it's really important for you to know that if you're going to do something like the Butterfly Project, there are grants available to get those butterfly kits through the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. Yeah, and then there is also there's another question. Um, trying to find it in the chat. Um, Lori had a great comment. The best part is the focus on bringing knowledge about what happened in the past forward to inform behaviors in the present. And that's what I wanted to respond to, which is um, the impact is visible because you could see the change in behavior or the actions of the students, right? The project is designed so that its action is, is the outcome. And that's really, you know, the best you could ask for in any initiative or program. Um, so I, I'm really happy that we've been able to bake that in there. Um, and the students can speak for themselves as far as how this has impacted them. And you heard from some of them earlier today. Nick, you addressed the link about the presentation. Thank you. Transcript of the chat box. Um, Hi, Melissa. Uh, we can also, yeah, we can send out the transcript of the chat box. Um, I can save the chat right now. It is saved. Um, and we can try to send that out because um, I know it has a lot of links. It's a really good idea. Any live commentary from some of the folks that are still here? OK, you don't have to speak. <laughs> Kiel, how's the baby doing? I don't know if you could speak. Is she sleeping? No, she found the um, presentation gripping by Nick, <laughs> so she woke up and now she's like, dang, she's just moving around. So yeah, tummy time. Yeah. My wife, she t makes me go in other rooms when I do these Zoom conferences because she says that I talk too too loudly when I'm on Zoom. I type too loud and wake the baby up. <laughs> just your passion. My my name's Keel, by the way. I work with David and uh, uh, Lauren and Nick on the Together Remember initiative. Um, so really uh, grateful to be here with all of you. And thanks for all the important work you do. And that is a great puppy in the background. All right. Anybody else? Before we end our recording and our, our Facebook Live stream. And yeah, by the way, we did put this on Facebook Live. So if you want to share this in that format, um, you totally can. I highly encourage you to. It'd be really helpful to spread the word with any educators, any groups of educators that you're part of. You can drop this link in there, and hopefully this is uh, useful. My mom's going to watch it on Facebook Live, too. She told me. So okay. hi. <laughs> hi, Mom. And, and David, your parents are probably watching. So hi to David's parents, too. Lauren's dad is or was on there. So hi, Lauren's parents. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's how you build an audience, folks. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I think we can go ahead and close it out. Jackie, thanks for helping. Thank yeah. you, Jackie. You, 